بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسلام عليه يوم ولد ويوم يموت ويوم يبعث حيا The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad the third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. There is a request for the brothers to move as close to the front as possible. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The brothers at the back. Thank you. Respected brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. The discussion concerning the Shia view of celebrating the birth of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma Is one of the most controversial discussions in Islamic thought. And a discussion which requires an in-depth examination. For it is a discussion which affects the lives of many Muslims in the world today. A discussion from which many lessons may be learned and many valuable examples may be derived. And indeed a discussion with a historical base and a contemporary significance. Many cultures throughout time have sought to venerate their most famous of personalities. This veneration and honor takes different forms in relation to the customs of that particular time. You find that many of the greatest personalities in history have remained alive because of the fact that the people who heard about their message continued to venerate them for years after they had left the earth. It seems as if their veneration made sure that while this person's body may have been under the ground, his message and his principles remained above the ground. And therefore you find that the reason many of these great personalities were honored was either because of a recognition of the sacrifices that that person had undertaken in their life or because there was a reciprocal love between the particular group of people and that person. As in if you were to look at any f personality in history, who countries have venerated, who religions have venerated, you'll always find that the veneration was because the people were intrigued by the fascination of the sacrifice of that personality. When they read his biography, they felt that that person's sacrifice deserved a veneration, deserved a form of honor. At the same time, they felt the same love which that person had displayed Towards them, they wanted to display back towards that person. Therefore, we find that since time immemorial, the idea of venerating a certain personality has been part and parcel of the culture of humanity. That's why it is not surprising when you find that in the same way, Muslims sought to venerate the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Many Muslims had recognized that the Holy Prophet had sacrificed everything for them in his life. And that there was a form of reciprocity in love between them and the Prophet. 
And this reciprocity in love would be performed or would be shown in what was known as a mawlid or a mawlud or a muslim depending on the different culture. You find, for example, within virtually every school <coughs> in the religion of Islam, there was a mawlid held on the date of the birth of the Holy Prophet. You see, in the religion of Islam, there are two opinions as to when the Prophet was born. One opinion is the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. The second opinion is the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal. And you find, therefore, that many Muslims gather together in that week. Ayatollah Muntadari, may Allah bless his soul, used to call that week the week of unity. Because he used to say that that is the week when Muslims should come together and celebrate the birth of the man who was a role model for all of them. In other words, you find many millions of Muslims around the world who come together in celebration. When you look at Shia literature, from the very origin of our literature, there was books produced to talk about the importance of the celebration of the birth of Rasulullah. For example, Shaykh al-Mufid has a fantastic work which is narrated by Najashi when he discusses Shaykh al-Mufid and narrated by others. The work is called Mawlid al-Nabi wal-Asfiya wal Awsiya, The celebration of the birth of the Prophet and the pure ones of the successors. Mawlid al-Nabi wal-Asfiya wal Awsiya. You found Shaykh al-Mufid from the time that he was living there was a focus on the importance of celebration of the birth of Rasulullah. And I would even go as far as highlighting that you would find that when we reached the 12th century, there was a genre of literature focused simply on the birth of Rasulullah and the merits from that birth. As in you find, for example, one of the most famous works was the work of Ibn Dihya. Ibn Dihya had a work which focused on the birth of Rasulullah, which was called Tanweer Mawlid al-Siraj al-Munir. Tanweer Mawlid al-Siraj al-Munir. This verse focused on how the Prophet is a pure light for all humanity, and it focused on the importance of celebrating his birth. Likewise, Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti wrote a whole work on the merits and the excellences of the birth of Rasulullah. You found, therefore, that throughout many cultures, be you in Egypt, be you in Morocco, be you in India, be you in the Arab states, you would find that there was always a great celebration on the birth of Rasulullah. The celebration, what would it entail? The celebration would be known as a mawlud. You see, the mawlud, the word mawlud or mawlid is what is known as a name which is mushtarak. Mushtarak of what? Mushtarak of time and place. Meaning that that mawlud seeks to focus on the time of the birth of a personality and the place. In other words, what you had in medieval Islamic empires was people would come on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal or on the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal and they would talk about the time Rasulullah was born, the place Rasulullah was born, and the position of Rasulullah as a light before mankind existed. If you look at Mawlid tradition, the idea was you talk about the nur of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And then what would happen in places like India, for example, as soon as the Prophet's name would be mentioned in a Mawlid, the people would stand in the majlis. They would stand straight away where you had one of the greatest treaties ever written on the Mawlud of Rasulullah was the treaties of Ayn al-Qudat Haydar Abadi. Ayn al-Qudat Haydar Abadi in reply to the Wahhabi attack, he wrote one of the greatest treaties. That's why you find tonight's discussion focuses on this issue. That while many Muslims used to celebrate the birth of Rasulullah, today the birth of Rasulullah is called a bid'ah, isn't it? As in how many times you go around countries which originally used to have a great love for Rasulullah on the 12th or the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal. They would hold congregations, they would give out food, they would allow people to come as a day of expression of love. Today you go to Saudi Arabia more than any other place in the world and you will not find expression of venom against the celebration of the birth of Rasulullah like in Saudi Arabia. 
In Saudi Arabia today, every lecture, the bid'ah of Rasulullah, the bid'ah of the birth of Rasulullah, the bid'ah of the birth of Rasulullah, you therefore find that countries like, for example, Indonesia were affected, as in a country like Indonesia, it sends so many millions, or let's say so many millions to Hajj. These people come back affected by the literature of the Wahhabi school. Likewise, today in our communities, people have asked that is it a bid'ah to celebrate the birth of Rasulullah? Or for that matter, by extension, is it a bid'ah to celebrate the birth of the Imams of Al-Muhammad? Or is it part of the teachings of the religion of Islam? Let me dissect this in a number of stages so we make clear the great merits in celebrating the birth of Rasulullah. Number one. Which prophet in the Quran did Allah say peace be upon the day he was born? Number two, which other prophet said peace be upon the day I am born? Number three, how do certain hadiths prove that Rasulullah himself honored the day of his birth by fasting on that day? Number four, and of the utmost importance, is it a bid'ah? to go and celebrate the birth of Rasulullah? If it is, then what is the meaning of a bid'ah? And is a bid'ah like the birth of Rasulullah as big as other bid'ahs in Islamic history? Number five, and of the utmost importance, when we come towards the Quran, how does the Quran teach us to honor Rasulullah? And how do we honor Rasulullah on the basis of the Quran? And number six, how important is it that we honor the births of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt throughout the year. Let's dissect this and dissect this topic in great depth. When someone comes to you today and says to you, brother, Mawlud and Nabi is a bid'ah. The first reply is I always state is from the Quran. You see, if you go to the hadith, someone turns around to you and says to you, hadith is not sahih, hadith is da'if, hadith is morsal, hadith is not muwathaq. You hear all of these terms for hadith. You start from the Quran and you say in the Quran, has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran spoken of the birth of a prophet and praised that birth? Yes. In which story? The story of Prophet Yahya alayhi salam. Because when you look in the story of Prophet Yahya alayhi salam, what do you find in the story of Prophet Yahya? You find in the story of Prophet Yahya that as we know, John the Baptist is revered within the religion of Islam and within the religion of Christianity. John the Baptist within the religion of Christianity is seen as the forerunner to the message of Christ. As in the rites and rituals of baptism that you see in Christianity today are in honor of Prophet Yahya alayhi salam. Prophet Yahya alayhi salam is therefore not only mentioned within the Bible but is also mentioned within the Quran. And is mentioned in the quite beautiful story of Prophet Zakaria and who? And Prophet Zakaria's wife Elizabeth and Maryam. As in when you look in chapter 19 of the Quran, the whole chapter is called Maryam. That's why some of my Christian friends, when they come and ask me about Islam, I say to them, suffice for me to tell you that there's a whole chapter in the Quran which is named after Maryam. Not only that, Maryam is mentioned more in the Quran than she is in the Bible. If you do a statistical analysis of Mary in the Quran and Mary in the Bible, you'll find Mary is mentioned more in the Quran than in the Bible. In the story of Mary, Zakaria and his wife Elizabeth cannot have children. Zakaria, what's his role in the story? Prophet Zakaria is the one who has been chosen to look after Sayyida Maryam, isn't it? He's the one who's meant to maintain the temple for her. He's the one who's meant to look after her in every way possible because she was devoted by her parents to be a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Her parents had devoted her to be a servant and you found in those days it wasn't normal for a female to be a servant in the monastery. As in those days it was a male dominated empire. Whereas today you find, alhamdulillah, there are many females who go to seminaries, who go and study the religion of Islam. In those days it was unheard of. Maryam, Zakaria would notice something beautiful about Maryam. What would he notice? Zakaria would notice that Maryam in the summer, the winter fruits would come to her. And in the winter, the summer fruits would come to her. Of course, in the world today, someone will say this is not unusual. If I want the fruits of Kenya and Tanzania now, they could come to me now, isn't it? And if I want the fruits, for example, in the winter time, they'll come in the summer, in the summer, they'll come in the winter. 
It's not unusual now. They'll all come towards us. Whereas what do you find? You find that in those days, maybe Maryam would sit down, say that Maryam would sit down. The winter fruits would come in the summer. The summer would come in the winter. Prophet Zakaria noticed if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do this for Maryam, then why don't I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide me and my wife with a child? As in all those years, him and his wife did not have a child. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he gives, he gives with mercy. And when he takes, he takes with mercy. Sometimes in life, when we don't have a child, we're married and we don't have a child. When we don't have a child in life, you find certain people, what do they say? They say, why has Allah done this to me? That I don't have a child. Zakaria is greater or you are greater. And yet Zakaria lived many years without a child. Ibrahim is greater or you are greater. And Ibrahim lived many years without a child. What did you therefore find? You therefore found on this area that when it came to Zakaria and it came to Elizabeth, Nabi Zakaria did something beautiful. He wanted to read the dua to say, Ya Allah, I want a child. But he didn't just read the dua anywhere. The Quran said, Hunalika da'a Zakaria Rabbah. Zakaria went and read dua where the fruits were coming. Where the fruits were coming. Why? It's one thing reading dua to Allah anywhere in the world. Supplicate. But it's another when you've seen an area where a holy personality has received Allah's mercy. Isn't it? As in, I could now read dua from here in New Jersey. Ya Allah, bless the Muslims. Look after the believers. But is it the same as reading dua by the grave of Rasul Allah? Of course not. Those who come to us in Jannat al baqiyah they come to us and they say, what's wrong with you, Shia, wanting to stand by the graves of Hassan and Zain al-Abideen and Muhammad al-Baqir and Ja'far al-Sahir? Go and read dua anywhere else. We reply, hold on, in the Quran, Zakaria could have read dua anywhere. Why did he read dua where Maryam's dua was being answered? Because he was highlighting there's an energy different. Where there's a great personality who's been there. Read dua by that personality. The energy is completely different. You found when he read the dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, you will be given a child who has not been given a name like that name before. And of course, Allah gave him a child by the name of Yahya after a six-month pregnancy. That's why you find... Nabi Yahya and Imam Hussein, so many similarities. Nabi Yahya was born after a six month pregnancy. Imam Al Hussein was born after a six month pregnancy. Nabi Yahya, alayhi salam, no one has his name before him. Imam Al Hussein, likewise, no one had his name before him. Likewise, Nabi Yahya, alayhi salam, his killing was avenged by thousands, and Imam Al Hussein's killing was avenged by thousands. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, when he was born, of course it was a miracle that you had someone who was born of this birth at a very late age to the parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to honor the birth of Prophet Yahya alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 19 verse 15 of the Quran said, وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمَ وُلِدَ وَيَوْمَ يَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ يُبْعَثُ حَيَّا Peace be upon him. The day that he's born. Isn't it? See, if someone comes and tells me, said, Ammar, the Prophet's birth is a bid'ah. I say, if the Prophet's birth is a bid'ah, why is Allah making such a fuss about the birth of Nabi Yahya alayhi salam? Salamun. What? Wa salamun alayhi yawma wulida. Finish. Peace be upon him the day he was born. Wa. Then the verse continues to say, Wa salamun alayhi yawma wulida wa yawma yamutu. Not just when he is born. Even the day he's died is a day of importance. Because today someone may turn it around and say, you Shia have a maulud of the Nabi and a wafat of the Nabi. What's the need? Rasulullah is a man who's dead. His bones are under the ground. Why do you need to have a wafat? The Quran says, وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمَ وُلِدَ وَيَوْمَ يَمُوتْ And the day he dies. You don't just remember the man when he was born. Remember his death as well. Someone says, why remember his death? Because Nabi Yahya alayhi salam died as a shaheed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, how did he die? The king of his time was a person who had a wife who was deceitful. This wife wanted a family member to take over the monarchy when she dies. So she told the king that I've got this niece. I want you to marry her in order that that niece looks after the kingdom after she dies. The inheritance goes towards the wife's side. The king at first said, I'll ask Prophet Yahya. 
Prophet Yahya عليه السلام, what did he say? He said this is something which is haram in, in the Sharia of Allah to marry your niece is forbidden. This man, one day his wife intoxicates him. He sees his beautiful niece. He's so enchanted that he says, even if I have to kill Prophet Yahya alayhi salam, I'll do it. And what does he do eventually? He kills John the Baptist, Prophet Yahya alayhi salam. He kills him and Prophet Yahya dies as a shaheed. Those of you who've been to Jami' al-Amawi in Sham. Jami' al-Amawi in Sham, you see the grave of Prophet Yahya alayhi salam. And you see Christians visiting the grave and Muslims visiting the grave. Because John the Baptist's head was laid in that area. And that's why Imam Zain al-Abideen salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Imam Zain al-Abideen says on our, way to Shah, on our way to Karbala, my father, Abi Abdullah, was saying to me the story of Prophet Yahya. And I was wondering, why does he keep saying the story? Why does he keep saying the story? Until I reached the Sham, the land of Sham, and I saw Hussein's head next to Yahya's head. True. They took it to Jami' al-Amawi, Abu Abdullah's head on one side, and of course, Prophet Yahya's head in the grave. You there found the Quran said what? Salamun alayhi. Yawma wulida wa yawma yamutu wa yawma yub'athu hayya. In other words, the Quran said, peace be upon him the day he's born. Why peace be upon him the day he's born? Because number one, his birth is a mercy to mankind. Prophet Yahya's birth is a mercy to mankind. Because Prophet Yahya alayhi salam had wisdom at a young age. It was a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says, وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ sabiya." We gave him wisdom while he was young. Prophet Yahya alayhi salam was given wisdom at a young age. He was a sign of Allah at a young age. He was a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, when someone like that is born, isn't that someone who Allah says salam on the day he's born? On the day that he's born, if someone's a sign of Allah, if someone's a mercy from Allah, if someone has wisdom from a young age, Allah says salam on the day that he's born. Because that day is a day of true honor for the human being. Prophet Yahya, Allah said salam on the day he's born. Prophet Isa said salam on me the day that I'm born. See, Surah 19 verse 15, Prophet Yahya. Go 15 verses later. Prophet Isa says, Salamun alayya yawma wulidtu wa yawma amutu wa yawma ub'athu hayya. Prophet Isa alayhi salam, if we said Prophet Yahya, someone turns around and says, yes, but you know Prophet Yahya alayhi salam, maybe when Allah said salam, he was just trying to say that I'm happy on the day he's born. Okay, now it's not Allah saying salam. Now Prophet Jesus is saying salam on his birthday. On his birthday, Prophet Jesus alayhi salam says, Salamun alayya. Nabi Yahya, the Quran said, Wa salamun alayh. Firstly, the birthday was celebrated by Allah. Then a prophet even celebrated his own birthday. That a prophet of God said, Peace be upon the day I was born. And the day that I will die. And the day that I am raised alive again. Notice here, Prophet Isa alayhi salam recognizes his birthday is truly a day of celebration. Why? Because you can bring science from now till the morning. It will never be able to explain to me how a virgin gave birth. Isn't it? As of today, you'll find every scientist, one coming one way, the other coming the other. There's no Allah. There's no Allah. There's no Allah. Your Lord looked at them and he said, I'll shatter all your science and I'll let a virgin give birth. Isn't it? What, you think your science? I am subject to your science? Wallah, your science is my servant. Your science didn't exist without me. I'm the one who allowed you to think mechanically about the scientific workings of this world. And in one moment, if I want to, I'll change all of it and you won't be able to explain it. As in when Prophet Isa was born, tell me who could come and turn around and say a virgin can give birth. Someone says, well, we'll work it out eventually. Did you manage to work out how Jesus raised the dead and made them alive? Or not yet? Or did you give eyesight back to the blind? Or not yet? You find in that story, Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam, the day he's born is a day of celebration. Because this man is born miraculously, number one. Number two, again, a sign of Allah. Number three, a mercy to mankind. In other words, the same criteria as Yahya, Nabi Isa, but Nabi Isa this time says, Salamun alayya. 
Peace be upon me the day I'm born. And that's why in Christianity today, whether people want to call it pagan or not, the Christmas day is a day when they seek to come and venerate the birth of their Messiah. Irrespective of whether I agree with them or I don't, the Christian at least has the heart to honor what Jesus gave for him. Unlike the black heart that sits in Mecca and Medina today. Otherwise, at least Prophet Isa alayhi salam honored and venerated without a doubt. Prophet Isa alayhi salam says salamun alayya. Likewise, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salam. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, our brothers in Ahlul Sunnah, if I was to leave our hadiths, our brothers in Ahlul Sunnah say, Rasulullah was asked, Ya Rasulullah, why do you fast on a Monday? If we were to say that Rasulullah was born on a Monday, why do you fast? He said, because the day I was born was on a Monday. Therefore, I fast on that day in honor of my birthday. And it was the day the Quran was revealed to me. Irrespective, I agree, 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal, our brothers in Ahlul Sunnah clearly, within their works, Rasulullah said the day of the fasting on a Monday. Like he said, Nabi Adam was born on a Friday, so Allah blessed us with Jum'ah in order of Nabi Adam alayhi salam. You therefore found if the day Yahya is born is a day of peace and mercy, and the day Isa is born is a day of peace and mercy, then the day Muhammad is born is not the day of mercy and peace. As in Rasulullah is the greatest prophet sent to mankind. In the words of every prophet of God. Therefore that day was a day of mercy. Someone turns around with the argument and they say. That yes okay Rasulullah's day is the day of mercy. The day he's born. But what's this bid'ah we have? So what do you mean bid'ah? Say the way we're celebrating today. The birth of Rasulullah. This celebration is a bid'ah. Say how? Says this celebration, you know, people getting birthday cakes and giving out food and so on. This celebration is an innovation, has nothing to do with Rasulullah at all. We reply, when you look at the bid'ah innovation, yes, كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ Every innovation is a form of deviance and every deviance or misguidance goes to hell. Okay. The bid'ah were divided. Bid'ah were divided. You had, if someone today, if you come to someone and you say to them very clearly, is a bid'ah, for example, a car is a bid'ah today? Because Rasulullah was on a camel, the poor man. So the car is a bid'ah today or no? He says, no, 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 no. That's intellectual evolution. And it's the point that that on Islamic law is intellectual evolution. In the time it was a camel, today we have a car. You say the pharmacy today is a bid'ah. When a person goes to the pharmacy, he says, what do you mean? Say, because in time of Rasulullah, people give out medicine. Today we have like a store with a green light and so on. Say, no, no, that's intellectual evolution. A university is a bid'ah. Because in those days they used to sit in the middle of a mosque. Today you have big institutions. That's a bid'ah. No, 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 no. That's intellectual evolution. So we say that there's a form of innovation which is intellectual evolution, which is accepted by all Muslims. It's something which is custom and rational. Then we have a second type of bid'ah. Bid'ah which goes against the words of Rasulullah or the nas of the Qur'an. Yes? What does that mean? Qur'an says one thing, you introduce another. That bid'ah we disagree with completely. That if I'm performing an act which disagrees with the principles of the Qur'an and the principles of Rasulullah, that's a bid'ah. Do you agree? A birthday cake is a bid'ah. This is a bid'ah. Someone says it's a bid'ah. There were many bigger bid'ahs in history. That's a bid'ah. Let's look at the list of the bid'ah. And you know what the beautiful thing is? It became good bid'ah, bad bid'ah, beneficial bid'ah. As in what you began to have, bid'ah hasana, bid'ah mahbuba, qabiha. Well, that's just so many bid'ah. It's unbelievable. You find of the bid'ah, and we, I could go into these in depth, and I've gone into them in other lectures. Rasulullah says to you very clearly, Salah, which is mustahab, you don't pray in jama'ah. Comes a man after Rasulullah says, no, in my opinion, it's a good bid'ah. That a salah, which is mustahab, you pray in jama'ah in shahar Ramadan. Yes? That salah, which is mustahab, 
Pray it in jama'ah in shahar Ramadan. You say, hold on, but Rasulullah said a salah which is mustahab is not to be prayed in jama'ah. Except salat al-istisqa, salat al-istisqa for rain. That's it. No, no, in my opinion, this is a good bid'ah. Okay. So you had an institution where you had a salah in jama'ah, which is only meant to be so-called mustahab. The nawafil became a jama'ah. He said it's a good bid'ah. Rasulullah, for example, said, Mut'a is allowed for my companions. Quran says, فَمَا اسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ هُنَّ فَآتُوا هُنَّ أُجُورَهُنَّ فَرِيضًا Quran says in Surah An-Nisa, فَمَا اسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ هُنَّ فَآتُوا هُنَّ أُجُورَهُنَّ فَرِيضًا It was accepted in the time of Rasulullah. It was accepted in the time of Abu Bakr. Then comes a man who says that these were accepted in the time of Rasulullah, but I'm the one who prohibits. حَيَّ عَلَى خَيْرِ الْعَمَلِ was in the Adhan before. Comes a man later on who says, remove hayya ala khayr al-amal. As-salatu khayru min al-nawm was not in the adhan. Comes a man later on who says, in my opinion, it's a good bid'ah. If you want to discuss bid'ah, then a birthday cake for Rasulullah is not a bid'ah. A bid'ah is when a person goes against the principles of the Qur'an and Rasulullah and starts introducing things where he starts saying, these are my innovations. Now, kulla bid'atin dalala wa kulla dalala fin nar. These bid'ah? No, no. These bid'ah because the person of the time said it's a good bid'ah. If it's about good and bad, if we're all allowed to make good and bad bid'ah, then why can't I say that birth of Rasulullah is a good bid'ah? For example, even though it's not a bid'ah, the idea of honoring the birth is in Yahya's story, is in the story of Isa, is in the story of the Rasulullah when he fasts on the Monday. But still, when someone comes and says this is bid'ah, no, we say a bid'ah is that which goes against the principles of Rasulullah and the Quran. Whereas honoring the birth of Rasulullah does not go against the principles of the Quran. How? Yahya, number one. Isa, number two. Look at the other verses in the Quran which show you that when we come to honor the birth of Rasulullah, we're not going against the Quran. Someone says we're not going against the Quran. You find, for example, I remember Ahmed ibn Zaini Dahlan, the Mufti, the Shafi'i Mufti of Mecca in the 19th century, when he heard people saying you shouldn't celebrate the birth of Rasulullah, he replied, there is a clear verse which tells us that we can. They said to him, what is the verse? He's a Shafi'i Mufti of Mecca before the filth came and took over. What happens? What does he say? Shafi'i Mufti of Mecca comes forward and says that the Quran says in Surah 22 from verse 32 onwards ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ And for those who come and honor the signs of Allah this shows piety in the hearts. Yes? So he said, what is the signs of Allah? He said, Safa and Marwa مِنْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ Don't we agree? Yes. Maqam Ibrahim min sha'ar Allah. The camel you use for hajj. Sha'ar Allah. He says, if all of these are sha'ar Allah, and I honor them, and I have more taqwa, so when I honor the greatest of sha'ar Allah, I don't get more taqwa in my heart. When the Quran says, wa man yu'adhim sha'ar Allah, so a camel, I honor, Allah says I get taqwa, but when I come to honor my Prophet Muhammad on the day of his birth, I don't get more taqwa. This is a shafi'i mufti. That's number one. You find, that's the first area. Second verse in the Quran. So now we've looked at the first one after Yahya, after Isa. This verse about Sha'ar Allah. Another verse in the Quran. Prophet Musa is told by Allah to tell the children of Israel, Surah 14, verse 5. And remind them of the days of Allah. Remind them of the days of Allah. What is the days of Allah? Allah. Someone says, hold on, Allah has days? Allah. It is to remind you of the, the days. There are certain days in history which get you closer to Allah, which remind you of the day of judgment, which remind you of Allah's blessings, which remind you of Allah's glory. In Surah 14, verse 5, Allah tells the Prophet Moses to tell the children of Israel, ذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ Because the tathkira of ayam Allah, what does it do? When I remember ayam Allah, I have a sense of taqwa in my heart, I have a sense of appreciation, a sense of shukr, that there are certain days in the life of the human being, in the history of the human being, are different from other days, isn't it? As in the day Ibrahim was saved from Nimrod. Isn't that a great day for mankind? 
The day Musa and the children of Israel are saved from Pharaoh. Isn't that a great day for mankind? The day Yusuf leads Egypt. Isn't that a great day for mankind? When the Quran said, It was saying, remind them of the great days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Ghazali comments on this. Please understand this delicate point. Ghazali says what? Ghazali says there are ayyam makhsusa bimazid al-fadl. There are days which are particular to the increase of Allah's glory. What is it? To the increase of Allah's blessings on mankind. Makhsusa bimazid al-fadl. Ghazali says one of the days makhsusa bimazid al-fadl is the birth of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Therefore you have in the Quran that there are days, Nabi Musa says, dhakirhum bi ayyam Allah. Ghazali says days makhsusa bi fadl Allah. What does it mean? Mazid bi fadl Allah means what? Mazid bi fadl Allah means that on that day Allah wants to increase his bounties on the human being. Because that day of the birth of Rasul Allah is a day of rahmah to the whole of mankind. When the Quran says remind them of the days of Allah, it's in other words telling us, keep reminding yourselves of the greatest days in human history. And I ask every Muslim in the world today, if you ask a Muslim what's the greatest day in human history for a Muslim, all of them will say the birth of Rasul Allah. Isn't it? That was the birth which came to save mankind. So the Quran therefore says, We're remembering the day of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of them is the birth of Rasulullah. Number three, Surah 7 verse 157. The Quran says about the Prophet Muhammad, فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِهِ وَعَزَّرُوهُ وَنَصَرُوهُ وَاتَّبَعُوا النُّورُ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ مَعَهُ The Quran says, those who believe in the Prophet Muhammad, وَعَزَّرُوهُ Someone says, what does عَزَّرُوهُ mean? عَزَّرُوهُ comes from the word تَعْزِير. This word means what? means to honor. Honor. The Rasulullah. The Quran says those who believe in the Prophet and those who honor. Honor can be in different ways, isn't it? I can honor Rasulullah by giving a lecture. You could honor Rasulullah by writing a book. We could all honor Rasulullah by making a big celebration in the mosque, isn't it? The Quran says those who believe in the Prophet and those who what? فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِهِ وَعَزَّرُوهُ وَنَصَرُوهُ Notice, Azzaruh, Nasaruh are different. Nasaruh means those who give victory to his cause. Azzaruh, therefore, isn't those who give victory? It's those who honor him. Honor him how? That it could be on the day he's born or every other day. Today, you know, when the Wahhabi says to me, he says to me that what is this? You're celebrating the birth of Rasulullah 17th Rabbah. I tell him, Habibi, I can celebrate the birth of Rasulullah every day. I don't mind. Forget that we're doing a birthday on the 17th Rabi' al-Awwal. It's a lecture on Rasulullah. That's it. Is it allowed? Say, yes, mashallah, you're doing a lecture on Rasulullah. Then that's what we do. Isn't it? 17th Rabi' al-Awwal, what am I doing? Like any other day. Wallah, if you came to him on the 24th of Rabi' al-Awwal and you've done a lecture on Rasulullah, say, mashallah, you are doing a lecture on Rasulullah. So what do you think I'm doing on 17th of uh, Rabi' al-Awwal? Running around, dancing? On the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal, I'm giving a lecture about Rasulullah to honor Rasulullah, to ensure people learn about Rasulullah. Again in the Quran, where? Surah 33, verse 56. Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallimu. The Quran says Allah and his angels send their blessings on the Prophet. O oh, you who believe, you send your blessings and your peace upon him. What do we do on the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal? We come, we send our peace and our blessings on him. And even when the Muslims came to ask me, Ya Rasulullah, how do we send our peace and blessings on you? Do we just say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad? No, that's Salat al-Batra. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You send your blessings on Muhammad and his family. That's why today if you go to some lectures of some mosques, Wallah, as soon as they hear Rasulullah's name, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. What's wrong? Your tongue can't go that far. For every other topic, bid'a, dalala, Wallah, his tongue doesn't stop for one hour. 
صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله say صلى الله عليه وآله what's wrong or even when he hears Rasulullah's name when you quote this verse in the khutbah in Salat al-Jum'ah over there إن الله وملائكته يصلون على اللهم صل على محمد وصلى الله عليه what's wrong as the family what have they done to you the family the family what have they done to you what is it Fatima al-Zahra and Ali ibn Abi Talha an enemy to you why don't you send your blessings on them what's wrong you therefore found again in the Quran all of these verses one after another what were they highlighting that when someone comes and telling me you're doing a bid'ah Habibi I'm not I'm honoring the Quran Quran said send your blessings on Muhammad and Al Muhammad the Quran came and told me honor Rasulullah the Quran came and told me Rasulullah is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other words by the Quran every act we're performing is in concordance with the Quran there's not a single act we're going by which isn't and that's why if you look at the fatawa of the great ulama of Ahl Sunnah aside from the books I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture Suyuti on the merits of the Mawlud for example you found if you look at the ulama of Ahl Sunnah all of them spoke of the merits of the Mawlud of Rasulullah for example Abu Shama Shafi'i he said the birth of Rasulullah listen to his words the birth of Rasulullah is a day where we express shukr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't it I as a Muslim it's a day I thank Allah that he honored me to know a prophet like the prophet isn't it that he honored me to learn the akhlaq of Rasulullah isn't it Abu Shama when they asked him should we do the maulid of Rasulullah because you know in the 12th century was a major century for discussions on the maulid of Rasulullah not in its validity but on books about how you do the maulid Abu Shama said do shukr on that day that's the greatest day you as a Muslim will go through the Quran said in shakartum those who give shukr, I'll increase. Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, in his discussion on the Mawlid of Rasulullah, they asked him, What's the benefits? He said, You should fast on that day because that day is when Allah's Rahmah comes down on mankind. So the Hanbalis, ironically, subhanAllah, the irony, the Hanbalis used to fast on the birth of Rasulullah. Then you have who? Who was the first to discuss the validity, Sharia wise, of the birth of Rasulullah? The first was Ibn Tabakh. Ibn Tabakh was the first to discuss this issue. And what did he say? They asked him that there are people in the birth of Rasulullah. Some of them might be drinking alcohol. You know, our people go crazy sometimes when, they, when they're happy. It happens. Honestly. Look at Shia and their weddings. Muhammad Rasulullah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. And then wait for the religious people to leave. People like me don't get invited to weddings. You know, I'm not modern. I'm a very backward person. And there are people out there who are much more modern than me in life. So I only get in invited to the boring events. I get invited to nikah. Come, Maulana, recite nikah. Everyone's acting religious. The groom probably doesn't know how to do ghusl. And you find that someone comes and tells me, Maulana, come do nikah. And then I find out later there's a bigger wedding but Maulana doesn't get invited so you're looking you're like why am I not invited so Maulana you know like uh, Allah was in the mosque but you know in the reception like this person's dancing with this person and the music and the yes Shia of Ali subhanallah what Ali ibn Abi Talib would do looking at his Shia today and even it's every Muslim, Shia, you find them in their weddings go ballistic. You find Ahl Sunnah and Eid, 30 days he's been fasting, mashallah. And he's been doing taraweeh, 30 days, the poor man, every night. The day of Eid, subhanallah, everything becomes halal. The party and the this and the that. The first to discuss this was Ibn Tabakh. Ibn Tabakh, people asked him that what is it that we do in the Mawlid of the Prophet? He said, what do you mean? He said, there are some people who do these things. He said, no, you recite poetry in honor of Rasulullah. Yes? You recite poetry. I get fascinated when people say, we have to have music in the wedding, otherwise we're going to get bored. When are you going to get bored? You're spiritually that low. That low you are spiritually, that you're going to get bored. I, this is cry in Muharram. And once Muharram finishes, act like everyone else. Find what? You find he says that recite poetry, recite the Quran, 
But don't do none of this drinking because you make you use Rasulullah's birth as an excuse. And that's why when the attack began on the Mawlid of the Prophet, the attack was begun first by Rashid Rada, the famous thinker um, and famous influential scholar of the 19th and early 20th century. Rashid Rada attacked the Mawlid of the Nabi. Why? Because he said people in their lectures on the Mawlid fabricate stories about how Rasulullah was born. And I agree that if someone comes to do a maulud of the Prophet, don't fabricate a story about Rasulullah. Rasulullah doesn't need you to fabricate. He's already a great man. You know what I mean? There are some people start telling you stories. Rasulullah you know, flew from the heavens and a horse flew down and had wings and the cloud hit him. You don't need to do these stories. Rasulullah is a great man. His akhlaq is more than enough. Ainul Qudat al Hyderabadi replied back by saying, No, that day is a day of shukr, a day of blessing. We don't ban it. If people need educating, we educate them. But then the Wahhabi machine began to block this particular occasion. They began to block. And ironically, when the Wahhabi machine began to block this celebration, it was a member of Saudi Arabia's high scholars who stood up against them. Muhammad. Ibn al-Alawi al-Maliki was banned from being a scholar in Saudi Arabia even though he was one of the highest scholars because of his work at Dhaka'ir al-Muhammadiyya. al Dhaka'ir al-Muhammadiyya within it major analysis of the greatness of the birth of Rasulullah in Saudi Arabia. 30 odd years ago they banned him from being a speaker or Mawlana again because they said how dare you tell the people to honor the birth of Muhammad. Muhammad's dead. One of their scholars, I don't want to bring him his name on Mimbar, he stood by the grave of Rasulullah and said, my walking stick is of more value than Muhammad. My walking stick helps me walk, whereas Muhammad's a dead body under the ground. And people get surprised when they hear this. Go and see what they've done to the house of Rasulullah, to the house of Fatima al Zahra. They've demolished all our buildings, all our graves, all our buildings have been demolished. So you get surprised that someone would say something like this? The Ka'ar al muhammadiyya was the book of Muhammad ibn Alaw al-Makki and Maliki in, in the land of Saudi Arabia, he spoke out against them and they banned him. He said, we used to honor the Mawlid of Rasulullah in this country. Why are we now blocking people from this Mawlid, this day of coming together, of learning about the greatest man? That's why that same country, when it attacks us, it says, you the Shia don't focus on Muhammad, you focus on his family. We don't focus. We have a Mawlud and a Wafat at least. You don't even have nothing on his birth and his death. We're the ones who honor him on his birth. We honor him on his death. We honor not just him, we honor his family as well. That's why when you look in Shia history in our literature, you'll find Sheikh al-Saduq would write a piece of work, Mawlid Mawlana Amir al-Mu'mineen. From that time, Sheikh al-Mufid, Mawlid al-Nabi, wal-Asfiya, wal-Awliya, Sheikh al-Mufid, Sheikh al-Saduq, all of our main scholars would always write a literature on the importance of honoring the births and the deaths of the Imams of Al-Muhammad. That you don't forget them. That's why Imam al-Rada says very clearly to Ibn al-Shabib, Ya Ibn al-Shabib, in sarrakan takuna ma'ana fi darajat al-ula fi al-jinan, fahzun li huznina, wafrah, Imam al-Rada tells Ibn al-Shabib, he says to him, if you want to be with us, with the Imams, in the highest levels of Jannah, then grieve at our days of grief and be happy on our days of happiness. That's the secret. That's the secret of what kept the school of Al-Muhammad alive, our Mawalid and our Shahadat. That's it. You go to any other school in the religion of Islam, any other school, Jum'ah is what just about keeps them alive. Whereas with us, Salat al-Jum'ah keeps us alive. Mawlud of Rasulullah, Wafat of Rasulullah. Mawlud Amir al-Mu'mineen, Wafat Amir al-Mu'mineen. Mawlud Imam al-Sadiq, Wafat Imam al-Sadiq. Mawlud al-Sayyid al-Zainab. These occasions made sure the legacy of these personalities remained alive. The lectures, the honoring, the brotherhood, the love, which we maintained in the wilaya. No, there's a walaya and a wilaya in Arabic. Walaya and wilaya. Which means we believe in the guardianship of Muhammad and Al-Muhammad and we hold on to them with our love and our hearts. That's why it's a shame in our mosques today. I say this as a conclusion. It's a shame in our mosques today that when it comes to the, for example, Mawlud of the Prophet, the mosque is full. When it comes to the Mawlud of Imam Al-Jawad or Imam Al-Hadi, the mosque is empty. It's a shame. 
that the school of Al Muhammad remained alive because every Mawlud was full, every Shahada was full. We didn't have such thing as big Shahada and small Shahada, big Mawlud and small Mawlud. Today, when it's Amir al Mu'min or Imam al Hussein, the whole mosque is full. When it's Imam Musa ibn Ja'far or Imam al Baqir, people can't turn up because they're busy. Busy for those personalities who gave their lives away for you. That a person makes excuses, I can't make it today. But for Abu Fadl al Abbas, suddenly he's wearing the best dress and he's got himself ready for eight hours. Whereas Imam al Jawad and Imam al Had, Imam al Askari, people leave them empty, the mosques with no one there. In other words, what kept our mosques alive were these births of Rasulullah and the wafat. And it's vital, unless someone puts their finger on the button quickly, then we're going to see emptiness in the, in the imam's births. Unless people make an effort, certain people turn around and say, well, you know, the speaker is not of a caliber. You're coming for the speaker or coming to honor the man who gave you a legacy? It's disgraceful. Around the Shia world today, Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Had, Imam al-Askari, people, no one comes to the mosque. Whereas Imam Ali and Imam Rasulullah, Imam Hussein, the mosque is full. Why? It is vital someone puts their finger on this button quickly, otherwise there's going to be problems. If we do not hold on to each of the 12, Rasulullah didn't say, I leave behind three. He said, I leave behind 12. And the moment the Shia realize, then it will have the biggest effect. Why? I want to be with the 12th, yet I don't know nothing about his grandfather. I want to be with the 12th. I wasn't on the wilad of his father. So how am I going to be with the 12th if I haven't honored any of his grandfathers? Isn't it? Therefore you found that the issue of the celebration of the birth of Rasulullah, most Muslims believe in. And it's a shame. You find it's a shame that a place like Indonesia, innocent Muslims affected by the filth of Saudi Arabia, Whereas, alhamdulillah, a place like Al-Azhar in Egypt, alhamdulillah, they stuck hard to ensure that the celebration of the birth of Rasulullah continues. And we hope that they don't get affected by recent things as well. And you find, for example, even in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, you still find that there is still an honoring of the birth of Rasulullah. In Egypt, there's still an honoring. In Sudan, there's still an honoring. In India and Pakistan, there's still an honoring. But you find places like Saudi Arabia, there isn't. And it's vital that people destroy this myth that we can't celebrate. Because without celebration of Rasulullah, how will we honor the sunnah of Rasulullah and protect his sunnah in our lives today? We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and al-Muhammad. To allow us to be amongst those who honor the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa zaman Inshallah, tomorrow will be the final of the majalis. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to receive the intercession of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and allow us to be next to his grave in the land of Karbala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite all of the Muslims and help the Muslims in the land of Syria and the Muslims in Pakistan and Afghanistan, the Muslims in Burma, our brothers who have lost their lives in Iran and our brothers in Bahrain especially who people forget, our brothers in as well in the land of Hijaz. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of them and protect them. We pray to Allah with the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before the loudest of your salawat.